Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the third event in our third annual speaker series here at the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Uh, my name is Kenji Yoshino, and I'm the faculty director of the center. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsors of our speaker series, uh, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, Davis Polk, DLA Piper, Reed Frank, Kirkland and Ellis, Latham and Watkins, Paul Weiss, Sullivan and Cromwell, Wachtell Lipton, Weil, and White and Case. Now I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest today. I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Lauren Rivera. Professor Rivera is a sociologist at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. She's an expert on workplace personnel practices with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her research has been featured in The Atlantic, The Economist, The Financial Times, Fortune, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and NPR. And most relevantly for today, she published her award-winning book, Pedigree, How Elite Students Get Elite Jobs in 2015. Professor Rivera earned her BA in Sociology and Developmental Psychology from Yale University and her PhD in Sociology from Harvard. Please welcome Professor Rivera to the law school. And it's my particular pleasure, I often moderate these, but for the first time we are elevating our uh, executive director, David Glasgow, to this position. Uh, David will be speaking with Professor Rivera for this event. He is executive director of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and an adjunct professor here at NYU Law. He received his BA in philosophy and his law degree from the U University of Melbourne, and practiced employee relations and anti-discrimination law at the international law firm King and Wood Mallisons. After completing a clerkship with the Federal Court of Australia, David obtained an LLM from NYU Law in 2014. Before I open the discussion, I'll mention the process for the audience Q&A component, which will be about the last quarter hour or so of our talk. Instead of taking audience questions via microphone, we're gonna do it via index card. Uh, you will have picked up an index card on your way in. Please write your questions on your card as they come to mind during the discussion. Helpers will then walk through the room and collect the cards, and David will read out a selection from the pile when we get to the Q&A. Without further ado, I'll hand things over to David. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenji, and thank you, uh, Professor Rivera, for joining us. I want to just start with the title of your book, uh, Pedigree, How Elite Students Get Elite Jobs. Uh, what do you mean by the term elite? It's a very good question. Um, so first of all, thank you, David, and thank you, Kenji, for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so in terms of elite, there are many ways that we can conceptualize what elite is. Um, some people, when they think of elite, they think of the 1% or the 0.1%. I think of the elite as individuals with my, um, in society who have disproportionate power over the means of production. That's often people who we might consider upper middle class. Um, the reason I chose to study the occupations I did, which are basically um, new jobs in banking, consulting, and law firms, most relevant to this audience, is that these jobs represent the entree into the elite as we think of it more broadly, the entree into the 1%. If you think of starting for law, uh, salaries at, at, from law school right now, it's what, 180 per year in New York? Um, that is, you know, that's more than most families um, earn in the United States, and that does propel you directly into the top five percent of incomes, and it depends what type of city you're in, but oftentimes the one percent. So um, I chose to, I think this is the gateway to the big elite that we talk about now mm -hmm. in terms of the, the top one percent, the point one percent, um, but I do think it's important when we think of what's elite and not to also consider um, people who are intimately involved in the production and reproduction of privilege in everyday life, which are often people we might think of as upper middle class. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that you studied three kinds of firms, consulting firms, investment banks, and law firms. Can you tell us a little bit about the nature of the project, like how the scope of the project that you embarked on and what some of your key findings were? Yeah, so I started off and I actually didn't think I was going to study these occupations at all. I went to my graduate school, I went to go get my PhD and had an interest in social status and thought I was gonna study popularity, high, high school popularity cliques. Um, I started off doing sundry studies. I did a study of who gets admission to really elite nightclubs, um, <laughs> which I offer all my MBA students nightclub consulting now that I'm of my age <laughs> and my advice and information is no longer 
longer valuable. Um, but I decided upon hiring because hiring is basically the biggest status sort that we go through, and it's one of the most consequential ones in terms of people's incomes, um, their their work satisfaction, their meaning, their health outcomes in a lot of respects. Um, and I wanted to look at elite jobs. Um, now, I actually wanted to study academics because I thought in my world being in a PhD program, the most elite you can get is possibly a professor at a research university, and I couldn't get access. Um, my advisor uh, emailed all of her friends and said, please let Lauren watch. You know, she promises not to interrupt or interfere, and everyone said, no, thank you. That is way too creepy. So I thought back to my days about who, what other elite populations do I know of? And I was a management consultant prior to going uh, back to graduate school. And at Yale, I knew a lot of people who went through the finance recruiting process, who went through the consulting recruiting process, including myself. And what was the other option in the 1990s besides doing banking and consulting if you were in Ivy League school? Law school, right? That's, and some people went to medical school. So I decided to look at this kind of triumvirate of occupations um, that were so economically elite. Um, and that's, that's how I decided upon them. Um, surprisingly, even though I couldn't get access to academic search committees, um, the book, I'm embedded in a firm for about nine months. I will not tell you what firm it is or any more details about it, but I got access really easily, which I was surprised. I was mm -hmm. like, do you know there are legal things involved here? I might see something illegal. Right. They didn't care. So right. um, it, was, it was kind of by default. But as I got in the field, I really loved it. I'm glad I studied this world, and I've spent my life since then studying this world, um, also studying academic hiring, my original thing. It wasn't nearly as interesting as I thought it was, but that's how I, how I came to this. And you originally set out, if I'm not wrong, to study gender in hiring yes. and then were diverted onto socioeconomic status as you continued in the project. So what happened yes. there? Yeah, so I thought that this was going to be a study of gender. If you look at law firms, banks, and consulting firms, you see that the representation of women at the time corresponded to some academic theory about how gender inequalities work because mm -hmm. law schools were at the time were about 50-50. We saw different in, in business schools and the firms also had different gender compositions. And so I wanted to see how that played out in the hiring process, if we could learn something new about gender. But being in the field, doing interviews, what I realized, gender is definitely a story, and I'm happy to talk about that. But social class was something that was so powerful, mm -hmm. um, and, and something that we haven't talked a lot about in the public eye, but also in right. academic circles. Um, we don't talk a lot about class bias or class discrimination in workplaces at all, let alone the act of actually discriminating on the basis of social class. Right. And so just to kind of unpack some of the, the class aspects of it, yeah. the recruitment process in these firms starts with a resume review process. And you note that the top four criteria that these firms, and not just law firms, across yeah. all the three firms you mm -hmm. studied, were in order of importance, school prestige, extracurricular activities, grades, and prior employment, particularly the prestige of prior employment. So can you tell us a little bit more about these four criteria? Why were they the important ones to these firms? And yeah. how does that um, impact socioeconomic diversity? Definitely. So the most important criteria across the board was institutional prestige. So how prestigious is the undergraduate school in the case of banking consulting or MBA program? or the law school. And that manifests in two ways. One is when firms designate lists of schools they will and will not go for on-campus recruiting, where are they actually diverting bodies and dollars? Right. Um, but then there's the secondary screen was even within that, how do we consider of all the people who are actually gonna look at their resumes, which some firms, um, if they didn't have a dedicated recruiting team uh, dedicated to a particular school and you sent in a resume to a generic email address, um, unless you had someone who was going to push that through, so someone right. would look at it, in firms that were less resourced, that just got thrown away, mm -hmm. right? It was, there was not a, a formalized system, and this has improved in the past several years, maybe as a result of my work, maybe not, maybe randomly. Right. But I, I think that firms are paying a little bit more attention to people outside core and target schools. Um, but at the time I was doing the research, if it was a, a non-targeted, um, non-connected resume, see a leader. Um, but even within the, the people who are applying through on campus recruiting from core and target schools, there was another screen based off of university prestige. This could be uh, certain firms allotted uh, had quotas for different schools. So every year we're going to interview, you know, 
50 kids from NYU Law School, um, regardless of if there's one qualified student or there are 100 qualified mm -hmm. students. Um, but as you mentioned, when people were actually evaluating resumes themselves, they further said, okay, how prestigious is this school? And I think that people did it for a couple of reasons. Number one was we have this notion um, in the US, and it came out very clearly in the interviews that I did, um, that we think school prestige signals intelligence. Mm -hmm. We have this very elaborate process that we go through to get into undergraduate, to get into law school, we have the testing, we have you know, letters of recommendation. It's very, quote unquote, meritocratic in a lot of people's heads. Um, and so a lot of people trusted that relative rank on, say, US News and World Report was a way to basically rank candidates by what they would call intellectual horsepower. Um, right. So that, I think that's one of the, the, the reasons. The other reason is that people saw admission to especially an, uh, an elite undergraduate institution as evidence of superior time management skills and then interestingness. The idea that elite undergraduate institutions admit partially based off of not only intellectual achievement, but also social and extracurricular endeavors. Um, people would often reflect upon their own classmates. Many of these people were graduates of elite schools and said, you know, oh, there were lots of smart, interesting people. The best people I ever met in my life were from that time period. So in addition to this university prestige being a signal of intellectual horsepower, it was also a, a basic, you know, is this an interesting person who can manage their time between academics and other things? Um, now, you might think that that is great, and a lot of people do think that. But what we, we know is that it's not that school students at the most elite schools are the smartest by any means. When it comes to superlatives, what we know is students at the most elite law schools, the most elite undergraduates, are the wealthiest, right? That is the huge differentiator. And there's a lot of research um, on this issue on social class biases um, in the admissions process. Um, and so when people are screening so heavily on institutional prestige, mm. they are also screening strongly on parental income and parental education. Right. So that's number one. Two is extracurricular activities. And I mentioned that these kind of overlap because people are thinking, especially at the undergraduate level, these well-rounded people are going to places like Princeton and so forth. Um, but in and apart from that, people were also screening off of that interests line on your resume, as well as participation in formal and informal extracurricular activities. Um, people saw that as a measure of, again, time management, the ability to manage multiple things, work mm -hmm. in law firms, work in banks, work in consulting firms is very demanding, and they wanted to see that people could handle a demanding schedule. Um, there was also a very uh, kind of innocent but not so great reason, which was looking at resumes is really boring. And so people were looking for things that were could distinguish some of your like, 100 resumes, they all look the same. Oh, but this person does fly fishing. That's really interesting. Or, you know, I'm a fly fisher. And we know from research that people, we like, we prefer people who are like ourselves. And we also think that they have um, more merit. Um, so those, those are some of the, the, the justifications people had. But just like university prestige, we know from research that the biggest predictor in involvement um, in structured extracurricular activities, particularly those that begin at young ages, um, and this is the case even for varsity sports at elite colleges, um, the number one predictor is, again, parental income, mm -hmm. right? So again, there's your screening off of university prestige, which creates all these class biases, and then you're doing a double screen on extracurricular activities, which further narrows the pool, pool um, right. based off of income. And then grades was really interesting. Um, there was variation by industry, and of course, grades actually matter a lot more in law firms than um, they do elsewhere, although it did depend by school. The grade threshold was very, very different depending on, on the school. Um, but even among law firms, I mean, there was, there was a lot of subjectivity in this, and you know, whose grades do we count? I found that people who had themselves been high achievers and, for example, law school, were very big believers in the use of grades. Right. People who did not do as well, in their opinion, were not big. And so they would do things to kind of, I'm going to discount that despite my firm's stated policy. Right. Um, you know, there's a question of socioeconomic biases in first year grades, given how early law firms recruit. Um, you know, I'm a little bit less nervous about grades because at least it's something that's not fly fishing or whether or not you started, you know, fly fishing or being an Olympic class swimmer when you were age five. Um, but it's still, these are all subtle class signals. The first right. two of them, I think, are a little bit more problematic than the grades one because research does suggest that grades are actually a decent way to um, get some information about future on the job performance. Right. And so once people have made it through this resume screening process, they then get to the interview. Um, and so what's expected of candidates in terms of how they present themselves during an interview and 
how do those expectations interact with socioeconomic status? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of them. Um, it, it's going to vary by industry. So I'm going to focus on law because that's our audience. Um, of the, the three industries, interviews were least structured in law firms, which was interesting. These were basically open-ended conversations about what the interviewer wanted to talk about. Some firms provided guidelines about what kinds of questions someone should ask, but no one was kind of looking over someone's shoulder enforcing that we all stick to the same script. Right. Um, but in these conversations that were very open-ended, um, interviewers got to use their own pet questions of what they thought would be a good metric of whether or not someone is intelligent or is would be good at analytical thinking or would be good in front of a client. And sometimes people had very bizarre questions, sometimes people had very good questions. Um, but in terms of what was expected for the candidate, there were a couple of things. One is that people were looking for evidence of polish, which was how they described social and interactional skills. This had a very class component and a very actually racialized component too about right. what constitutes um, professional communication. We found for both um, African American and for Latino students, they never seem to be able to be perceived as having the right polish. Right. Um, you are always too quiet, or Asian American candidates as well, you're always too quiet, too loud, too dominant, too scary. They had, I mean, it was, and when I heard these conversations, um, both in the firm I observed, but also in, in, in the interviews, um, it, it was quite striking. But that idea of being polished was one. Um, the second was fitting. Um, fit was one of the most important criteria that interviewers look for um, in law firms in general, at least the one places where I interviewed, there was not a check on fit. There wasn't that, you know, fit can only sway 20% of the decision. It could sway 100% of the decision, um, especially if people didn't take the initiative to ask more specifically job relevant questions. And that was basically, do you have a sense of connection or rapport with the interviewer? And it was often, does the interviewer feel similar to you in some ways? Do we have something shared in common? Common. Sometimes it was a shared alma mater. Sometimes it was a shared interest off the resume. Sometimes it was just uh, one example of the book of um, the, an interviewer brought out his laptop and he had pictures of Harley Davidsons on it. And the interviewee, uh, this is he was he was also an attorney who interviewed candidates, but he was telling you the story about how he got his job. And he was talking about oh he asked him oh you like Harley Davidsons, and you know they just started talking about Harleys and their beloved Harleys. And you know, it, it's this sense of commonality that was kind of unpredictable, but right. interviewers were looking for it. Um, the last thing that I'll talk about is having the right personal story. Um, interviewers were looking for candidates who told a very specific narrative of where they were going, why were they interested in this job, and what they saw their future was. And it was a, a very specific plot line that was linear in terms of continuous record of achievement. I, you know, I, I had a goal from whatever age, and I took this step, and then this next school I chose, and the next job progressed upon that, and things like this, mm -hmm. in a very linear fashion that was uh, driven by internal demands, like I had a passion for this, I have an interest in this, any type of discussion of external constraints, like I had to work because I needed money, I need to send money home, things like this, these were kind of buzz kills that could detract unless someone was able to wave the, weave these things together into a, a kind of rags to riches stories where we talked about very extreme cases of upward mobility. Right. And so you've talked quite a bit about this similar to me bias. Um, so to what extent is the problem with the recruitment processes themselves? And to what extent is it just a problem with the fact that these firms have so many elites in them that the way similarity bias is operating is that it's replicating elites? So if as a raw demographic fact, there was more socioeconomic diversity and everyone's still applying similar to me bias, yeah. they'd presumably be replicating a more diverse bunch of people. Would you still be concerned about the way they're doing their hiring, or is that okay and the problem is just who's inside these firms? So it's both. Unfortunately, the answer isn't as simple as just diversify and then right. use similar to be biases to make things even better. Because what we know from research is that when you have members of underrepresented or historically underrepresented groups who then are in positions of authority, they often display the same preferences of people from majority groups. So you still get a preference for dominant groups even when you diversify. So it's right. better than nothing, 
right? right. Um, but I don't think that's the problem. I mean, human psychology is such that we prefer people who are like ourselves. Similarity is the biggest, besides proximity, is the biggest predictor of if you like someone. So it's not that we can actually harness that. We just want to harness it towards better ends. Right. Um, but I, I don't think that we can just reproduce a, a, a firm that is diverse won't actually create a mirror image of itself. You'll actually see it skew back towards a dominant group without intervention. Right. And so law firms, um, although you studied three kinds of firms, law firms did stand out in your analysis in a couple of ways. So one was that you mentioned they offered the least interview training of the, the three kinds of firms. Yeah. Um, and they also relied more than the other firms on the concept of cultural fit as a metric. Why do you think law firms stood out in that way? I think that I think the two things go hand in hand. I think the more the more discretion you give interviewers and the fewer structured tools you use it to measure merit in an interview, the more fit is going to carry the day because that's what people have to go on. Right. So the emphasis on fit was still strong in consulting and banking, but in consulting, for example, um, the majority of a consulting interview is a, a business case where you are orally solving a, a problem with someone together with numbers on a page for 30 minutes, right? right. And in that case, um, I mean, Similar to me, biases also work in, in the assessment of those cases, and those cases are not perfect, and I'm happy to talk about them, but you have more data to go on than just, I see where you went to undergrad, I see this is, you know, are you on law review, are you not, this is what you like to do in your spare time, tell me about a paper you wrote, maybe? Um, you know, it, with these open-ended conversations, that's what you're gonna get. Um, right. And also, it's not always necessarily malicious on the part of interviewers. Um, you know, we think that we're really good at spotting talent, and if we just sit and talk with someone in a room, we're gonna get it. We're actually really bad at it. Um, mm. You know, we talked at lunch, there's this study that was written by a group of researchers that was featured in the New York Times a while ago. They um, did an experiment where they gave an interview, where they set interviewers up with a job candidate, and in one half of the cases, the interviewees gave well thought out responses to what the interviewer had asked. And in the other case, they were just instructed to say random things that sounded business-like in response to different questions. And the interviewers preferred significantly the people who were just saying random stuff, right? <laughs> so again, we think that we're really great at this, that you know, we can just sit and, but what we end up doing is we're making a lot of decisions based off of, uh, of biases that we have, whether someone's similar to us, things like how straight their teeth are, how tall they are, how white they are, how pretty they are, you know, things mm -hmm. like this. And so on the cultural fit metric, you point out that it's not often related to work style. It's much more about, you know, play style and I think interacts with similar similarity bias where there's the famous airport test of, you know, would I want to be stuck in an airport in Minneapolis in a snowstorm with this person, right? Just to play devil's advocate, you know, isn't there a sense in which because of the long hours that you're working with people, you do want people who are going to make that experience more enjoyable for you. And sort of, isn't it fair for them to look for people that they're going to be able to be stuck in the airport with in Minneapolis? Yeah, I think that it's totally fair. And I think that it's important to distinguish collegiality from a photocopy of yourself. Because right. there are people who can be collegial and who can be interesting to talk to without sharing a lot of commonalities with you. In fact, a lot of the most interesting conversations are with people where you learn something, where someone's different, and right. we're kind of narrowing, we're kind of Xing out that possibility by doing that. The other thing I think that people discount is that, especially when you're working in close quarters with someone over long hours, is the power of shared context. Is that, you know, when you think of people who, if you went to college and lived in the dorms, you have this intense bond in terms of the shared, you know, the, the shared environment, the shared physical environment, you go through the same things. Um, sometimes people come away from these intense experiences and they say, how did I get along with that person? They were so different from me. Right. But shared context actually, and interacting with someone on a day-to-day -day basis can actually produce a lot of bonds um, that I think people forget. They assume that we have to be similar at the beginning, at the outset, to actually talk and get along. Um, and the research on diversity shows that you might have to do a little bit more work at the beginning, but you actually, people mm -hmm. do learn and grow talking to people who are different from them. And I also think that the types of similarities that people were looking at as evidence of cultural fit um, in the absence of any kind of intervention about this is what organizational fit might be or this what my job might fit might be was things like extracurricular activities, what sports teams do you root for, like do you like wine or beer? I mean little things that mm -hmm. um, you could always make a case for maybe that's job relevant but 
is it really at the crux of what we do? Probably not. Right. Um, one of the kind of things I found most striking in your book was the comparisons that people made between the hiring process and the dating process. So people would say things like would say that they were looking for candidates who made them feel passionate, riled up or fall in love with them. Yes. But candidates could also go too far by giving off a desperate or creepy vibe. Yeah. Um, and so why was this kind of emotional arousal metric used? Yeah. yeah. So it's actually interesting. I have a whole paper on this about the different emotions and things like this. And it was interesting because the men would describe it as passion and the women would describe it in terms of more romantic, but that's a different <laughs> story for a different day. Um, but um, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think that part of it is an American thing. It's a US thing. Um, we know that people in the US value positive emotions more than almost any other culture. And the emotion that we value the most is excitement, right? That is completely gratifying to people in the United States. So I think there's something um, very national about this, that that's what we seek everywhere is exciting, is exciting rather than calm or, you know, things like this. So I think that's one of the things. Um, I think the other is, is that there is just a more general trend in social interaction. There's a sociologist who is wonderful and very theoretical who talks about this feeling of excitement, and I would say in the United States, as being the primary driver of, of what we actually decide to attuned to and what we don't. Do we watch a program because it's boring? No, we want to tune into what's exciting or what captivates us, that kind of thing. Right. So I, I think that's part of it. Um, I also think that interviewers, you're all working very long jobs or long hours in jobs that are not always very exciting and people are looking to kind of fill up their stores and pump themselves up. And you know, if you're really excited about it, can at least it's, it kind of re-energizes you. Um, but the, the passion and the falling in love, I think that it really is we like to think of hiring as this very systematic thing that's extraordinarily measured. In most firms, it's not. But it, it is fundamentally an interpersonal interaction that's about attraction. We know from research the biggest predictor is if you're going to get hired is if someone likes you. Right. And how much of this do you think is a kind of conscious or an unconscious process? So are firms kind of trying to replicate themselves with elites, or are they striving for merit-based decisions but just going about it in the wrong way? Somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So I think that everyone wants to think that their process is meritocratic. Um, I think that people aren't necessarily reproducing socioeconomic biases intentionally, because that's not on a lot of people's radar screens. Right. Um, I do think that some people might be aware that they might be reproducing themselves. Right? So I had a surprising number of people talk to me, like one person actually opened the interview by saying, everyone just hires themselves. This is not an objective process. So I do think some people are cognizant that you know, we tend to gravitate towards people who are similar in biography, work history, et cetera, to us. Um, but uh, you know, so I think it's in the middle. I think that people kind of know that there might be bias towards certain candidates, but I don't think that they are necessarily are aware that the social class bias happens, and I don't think that people are intentionally trying to completely tilt the playing field. Right, um, and not every candidate, of course, who who gets into these firms is is elite, right? So, can you tell us a bit about the exceptions to the rule, like the yeah. students that were from non-elite backgrounds who got hired, and you know what? What got them through the door? Yeah, so I have a chapter in the book on people from non-traditional backgrounds because some people read the book and or hear me talk and they say, but I know someone who from a working class background who was in my firm or I am from a working class background. And we were talking at lunch, that's part of systems of, of inequality and reproducing them so that people don't revolt as if there were no people from these backgrounds, it would be illegitimate. And we'd say, oh, this isn't meritocratic and in the United States we value this. But there are people and people can point to evidence of that as, oh, things are okay. But what I found is that the people from uh, working class backgrounds who entered these firms tended to be, uh, they had, had at least one foot already in elite worlds. Right. So um, many of them had attended elite undergraduate institutions, um, you know, they participate in programs like Prep for Prep, which is one here locally in New York City that uh, attaches people um, from underrepresented backgrounds to pre elite prep schools that are um, uh, feeders to Ivy League schools. Um, another pattern was that people had, a, they somehow had an in. They had one person who could push for them um, if they were at a non-targeted school. 
like mm -hmm. a connection, or someone who could teach them the ropes. So I had one person who was a vet. It was not in law. It was in banking, and he didn't. He was first gen and from a working class background, and he did not know how to get into this world. So he used. He drew upon his veterans network, and basically, he. I describe in the book. I'm going to get the details. I'm just going to give you general details because I can't remember exactly verbatim what he said. But to paraphrase, he described calling any vet he could find in the New York area who worked in an investment bank, and then interviewed them about what he sh the interview process would be like. And then he asked what the most common questions were and had them give their responses. He uh, recorded all of these conversations, and then he uh, memorized them. And so when he got similar questions in the banking interview uh, process, he would give their responses. Um, I had another guy who was a lawyer. He said that he just imagined his best friend, who was from a very wealthy family, he just imagined what he would say. And he just completely just, you know, went into that mode and just, just acted like him, just play acting, right? Just and would do it. So, um, but you have to have contact with elite worlds to understand the rules of the game or to have those social connections to teach you what you need to do in the interview or to um, put you in touch with the right person. Because one of the surprising things about all these interviews, if you are not from this world, is that what's valued is a conversation. And it's almost a good interview feels like a conversation. It flows. It's a conversation almost among equals. Right. Um, and that's very weird if you've never been in this world, because this is not a situation among equals. This person has a job and you want it, right? <laughs> and if you grew up in a working class background, chances are, your research would suggest, your perception of that situation and you kind of how cultural norms in classrooms and things like this would suggest that that person answers or asks you a question, you will answer that question, and then you will wait for the next question to come, right? And so you're gonna ask a question, I answer, and it's not this conversation that we start talking about, scuba diving in some foreign country, it's an interview that is precisely targeted at whatever the interviewer is saying, which to an interviewer from this world feels incredibly cold, incredibly awkward, and not like someone you wanna be stuck in the airport with. Right. So you need that coaching. Um, so it was often people had institutional ties, or people had, um, people had um, interpersonal ties to elites. And then the US military, as uh, I gave that one example of the vet, did seem to be one institution that could compensate for a non-elite background. Part of it was through the social connections. The other is that people saw military experience, but it had to be US military experience. Um, and they thought it gave them that emotional boost that was often lost through, oh, wh what sport did you play? I have nothing in common with you, but you were in the army. That is cool. That is dangerous. That is cool. <laughs> I appreciate your service. It, it were filled right. with uh, positive emotions that could compensate. Right. Um, so I just want to remind everyone to write their questions down on a card. We're going to have um, a wonderful assistant, Shirley, go around and start collecting questions. Um, and I'll move to the Q&A uh, portion soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, your book is mainly about socioeconomic status that we've been talking about. But you did mention there are some intersections with other aspects of identity, right? Socioeconomic status is not protected under federal anti-discrimination law, but race, uh, sex, and national origin are. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about those interactions, right? Like, was it a kind of double whammy if you were from a lower socioeconomic background and also a woman or also uh, from a racial minority? Yes, yeah, so I'll, talk, I'll talk about the gender one first, um, which is not in the book, but it was a follow-up study that we did. Is because my, and I say we, because I have a co-author, Andras Tilsik, who's at the University of Toronto at the Rotman uh, School of Business. So from the book, I was thinking, hey, we have all these biases in favor of students from higher class backgrounds. But research suggests we have all these biases against women, right? And part of cult being a good cultural fit was participating in very stereotypically masculine things. This was strongest in banking, but you also saw it outside of banking where people used athletics and sports as a measure of fit, right? I love student athletes and people had justifications for why athletes were superior that I'm happy to challenge in the Q&A. Um, but, um, but so I was wondering, okay, what do we do? I couldn't parse out just through watching what the interaction between gender and social class was because I was, I was, I was thinking what wins out. Right. Um, so my colleague and I, what we did is we did an audit study. So for those of you not familiar for audit studies in the room, audit methods are considered to be the gold standard for studying discrimination. And it comes from a long tradition of studying housing discrimination, or racial discrimination in housing. And they'd send testers to real estate offices and say, I want to see a house in X neighborhood. And they see, do we show it to the white person? Do we show it to the black person? And we can measure discrimination that way. Um, and so this has taken off. There's something called a correspondence audit where you do this all by paper. And long story short, what people do for employment and hiring discrimination is they 
send fake resumes to real employers and see what happens. So we did this study in the portfolio world. Um, we, in order to make this work for applying for law school, for associate jobs, we had to look outside of on-campus recruiting. So we didn't go to top. 25 schools. Um, but we sent the exact same resume um, that was uh, presumably either a high class resume as signaled through extracurricular activities or a lower class resume, or work, I should say relatively lower class um, background um, as signaled through extracurricular activities. And then we just changed the name, whether it was like John or Julie. And what we found is the uh, there was significant discrimination in favor of higher class men. And I think they were like four times more likely to be called back than anyone else. Um, what was interesting is that we didn't see upper class women did really poorly. And we were trying to figure out why, so we did some online experiments and things where we could send more measures. What we found is this, is that upper class men and women are seen, at least when they participate in some sort of sport, are seen as equal fits. They're equally good fits for a law firm. But what we see is that women don't reap the advantages of being a good fit um, because upper class women are presumed to be future, and one of our interviewees said, future soccer moms in the making. So there's this idea that upper class women are going to drop out of the law or drop out of the labor force entirely. Now think about this for a second because we're interviewing associates who might be 24 years old, 25 years old. Most of them do not have children. Uh, many of them are not married, but that was not salient in these individual minds. It was this, it, we call it a pre-motherhood penalty. It was this idea that you one day could potentially be a mother, therefore I don't really want you. Um, working right. class women or middle class women, they had, people had very different perceptions. So in terms of how do gender and, and class interact, um, you're doubly advantage if you're a higher class man, if you're a higher class woman, if you're from a non-elite school, you, you have some challenges. Um, in terms of race, it was really, really interesting because people assumed, in the qualitative in the book, um, that anyone who was a racial minority was low income. And one of the ways that this was really interesting in terms of how it played out for candidates is that one of the ways into the firm for people from underrepresented backgrounds was to present this bootstrapping narrative. I came my way from nothing and I worked myself up and it was only me and things like this. But people expected minority candidates to have bootstrapping narratives. So they assumed um, that they would tell this, this dramatic rags to riches story. And when you got middle class minority candidates who were not telling these narratives because that was indeed not their story, they were penalized because people said, oh, there was just something off about that interview. I didn't think they were really ambitious or you know, they just disappointed me, things like this. So we see right. the intersection of class and race operating in a different way. So I think that there's a lot that could be teased out uh, more, but those are just some initial. Great, so, so let's talk a little bit about recommendations for reform. So your book understandably focuses on what law firms can do primarily um, to reform their hiring practices. So based on your research, what would you recommend to law firms? Structure. I think, <laughs> and I think that there, first of all, there has to be a desire for doing something to change anything in the recruiting process. That's number one is you know, having that desire. But two is finding ways to make the process more structured and nudge people towards using more job relevant criteria. Um, so part of that can be, you know, if you're scoring resumes, having some sort of scoring rubric that is very well laid out, um, that, you know, that goes beyond university prestige. Um, in interviews, which I think are the real problem in law firm recruiting, I think that resumes are actually a bigger problem than consulting. Um, but in interviews, I mean, it, it's about having people simulate whatever the skills you want them to do are in the interview itself. We know that's the best predictor of on-the-job performance. Because my problem with unstructured interviews is not only that it's a free-for-all in terms of class bias race bias, gender bias, but they're actually really, really bad at predicting how good someone is on the job. Right. So I think you could actually solve two problems at once by creating ways to test the skills that you would want to see an associate in this interaction. Um, and that's going to involve uh, basically standardizing questions across interviewers and across candidates. It cre involves creating scoring rubrics so that we don't just leave people up to their own biases to decide if you did well. We actually have specific behaviors we can point to right. to score. Um, I see firms doing this a lot where they have, you know, rate someone's social skills, a scale from one to five, that's scientific. It's not if you don't, if you don't specify the behaviors that correspond to each level. Uh -huh. So. And so, and so we sometimes get pushback from, from firms that we speak with on the structured interview um, point because you know, firms will tell us that they're worried that it's going to come across as very chilly and robotic and mechanical to do structured interviews where they're not just assessing candidates, they're also trying to recruit them, right? And, and 
give across a certain vibe of you know, warmth and approachability. Um, and so how could you serve the goal of structured interviews while also retaining that sort of warm, approachable feel? Or do you see those as, as intention or in conflict? I don't see them in, as intention. I think when most people think of structured interviews, they think of putting a lot of interviewees in a room together with a pencil and like a Scantron sheet, and that's what a structured process looks like. Um, if we do these things interpersonally, there are a lot of ways to actually make them quite warm. If you look to consulting with these case interviews, when I said there's a 30-minute case where people go back and forth, I saw mouths go, really? Right? There are ways that some of your, your competitor industries are doing this, and they're doing just fine. Right? In fact, they're actually the demand for students are really happy going to consulting firms at the moment for a number of reasons. Um, but second, it, it, the execution matters, right? You can make someone very comfortable doing very strange tasks by just welcoming them, being warm, friendly, approachable. But third, and I think this is the most important, is that when you leave people to their own devices, they're saying weird things to your job candidates behind the scenes that actually might be more of a turnoff than actually having them someone do a focused task relevant to being a lawyer. I mean, the job candidates I talk to, they would welcome the chance to demonstrate their skills and welcome the chance to not have an interaction about what novel they would read if they were alone on a desert island for 32 days and you know one eye was going out or things like this. I mean, interviewers have these bizarre questions that are, are often well-intentioned in terms of why they're asking. Um, if you look at Glassdoor, they have all these reports of the wackiest interview questions are the most common ones. There's actually some overlap. But I, I do think you actually can save yourself, you can, you can increase your uh, students' perceptions of you um, by taking out some of that awkwardness. And some of that awkwardness is also going to help you with diversity because we know that the targets of a lot of those awkward comments are women and underrepresented racial minorities, um, as well as individuals who are openly gay or suspected of being gay. So, you know, I think that I think that, that is. I think that it actually helps a lot. So we have some um, wonderful questions from the audience. So I wanna get started with a couple that relate um, to law schools, because we've been talking a lot about law firms, but obviously these problems start earlier, right? So one person asks, um, you know, doesn't this need to start with law school admissions? If more elite law schools accepted and provided scholarships to low-income students, then the school prestige factor would be eliminated. Another person asks, are career services professionals of law and other graduate schools failing to prepare their students to interview successfully? So we have a question about yeah. admissions and then also a question about once we have people in the school, like are the career services uh, professionals you know, doing their best? Yes. So I think that law school admissions are one place you have to start, right? The more diverse we have of a population we have to recruit from, um, the harder it is, especially with racial diversity and gender diversity, social class, again, it's not a protected status, and it's also not reported on now, right? But when you have a more diverse student body, it's harder to justify why you are not hiring in, right. that, in a way that represents, um, that, that mirrors the school. That I don't, I think that how human psychology works is even if we had more diverse law schools, you'd see other justifications for not hiring people from working class backgrounds, right? Um, and especially in the interview process with FIT and things like that. But I, I think that's a, an important starting point um, because we do know that the power of networks and coming, being in an elite institutional environment does matter. But again, I don't think that's the end all be all. Um, I think that, a lot of the other criteria other than the school you go to are very, very classed. Um, and I think secretly, this gets to your prior question, I do think that people feel more comfortable around people who are similar to themselves, including from similar class backgrounds. So I think people would find ways around it. Mm -hmm. So I think that you need interventions in law schools, but you also need interventions in firms. Mm -hmm. um, and your second question, about, I forgot the second question. Uh, so the second question was, are career services professionals yes. at law and other graduate schools failing to prepare their students to interview successfully? It's hard to say because I think that different schools do different things. Um, I think that they are probably preparing students in a very homogenous way. Like all students need the same skills, but I think certain groups of students are expected to perform differently, um, and certain groups of students might need a little bit more knowledge about you know, the recruitment process. So I think that the, the, it needs to be tailored a little bit, but I also think that career services is complicit in this in some respects, right? Many schools force their students to write their interest in extracurricular activities on their resumes. 
you guys have power. You could say, we're not doing that at NYU. And that would make it a lot harder for firms to make these fine distinctions on the basis of social class. Also, there are clues often about gender, or often about race, or often about sexual orientation that people could also use as reasons to discriminate against someone. So I, I do think that law, the career services uh, offices do have some power. Um, but, um, but yeah, the other thing that I just want to say about that is that there's something about knowing what the rules of the game are and being natural at it that are different. So that interview I told you about, when he just like memorized what everyone said and said it back, he was very lucky because that strategy could have failed. Like mm -hmm. if that seemed robotic or if it seemed, you know, he, he didn't practice it to the point where it seemed natural in conversation, um, it could have failed. So um, I think that career services can do some training, but I do think, I think there's more, there are more institutional problems that we also have to solve. Mm -hmm. So another um, question is what advice you would give to people that don't have an elite background? So this is from, I guess, from an individual student side advice moving away from the institutional. Yeah. So I hate this question because I feel like I want to say we should change this system so you don't have to do these things. But then in the interest of getting a job next week, you should do these things. So um, I think that, um, are we talking about a student at an elite school or a non-elite school? They didn't specify, so you can take okay. it however you wish. A student at a non-elite school has to, you have to network like crazy to find someone, an alum who's, you know, happens to be at a firm and will pass on your resume and get attention, right, and who will vouch for you. If you're at a place like NYU, I think that, uh, you know, grades are, of course, one thing. Being involved in whatever extracurricular activities, um, both in and out of school, that people value. I mean, law review and law firms is, a, as you guys know, a big deal. Um, but if you're, which is different in every school. But, um, but I think a lot of it has to do with the interview process and making sure you find a way to connect with your interviewer. Um, I give one example in the book of someone who is coaching um, her partner at the time in how to interview for, um, it was a law firm. Um, and she was saying, you know, she didn't understand he was at the top of this class, he was getting all these interviews, he never got job offers. And so she did a, pro a mock interview with him and she realized, she was like, oh, we need some intervention here. And she realized that it was kind of this static, this I call response type of interview. She said, find something to connect with with your interview. We notice like if they have a, a picture on the wall of their kids, say something or you know, try, find some way to create a dialogue not about the work itself. Um, and he, he did that and he found a way to connect with every interviewer and then he got lots of job offers. So I think finding a way to connect, um, buying my book, using all those tips that are not <laughs> tips, they're really meant to change the system, but you can use them to your advantage. Um, I think having your personal narrative down in a way that is palatable, Again, it's linear, it's all positive. Maybe there's one little bloop before you go back up, but that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so what are your, another great question, what are your views of using algorithms and artificial intelligence for screening candidates? Presumably hiring still involves human interaction, but will AI improve diversity or will it perpetuate the same biases? It's a great question. So algorithms are only as smart as the people who create them. And we know that people are biased. So I think the Amazon case is a really good example that they were using an algorithm to screen resumes. It turns out this was systematically discriminating against women or being biased against women. And um, we have to consider what the priors are, what the model is built on. So I don't think AI is a magic fix. Being in a business school, I get approached like every week, someone wants to create an app that's gonna make everything better. And we're gonna automate this completely. And honestly, like, I think that there is, technology can help us in a lot of ways, but it's not going to magically solve biases without, um, without further intervention. Um, I do think that platforms that allow us to, again, do demonstrations of job relevant skills can be really helpful. So there's Gap Jumpers as a startup, and rather than screening resumes, it was created by someone who I can't remember if he didn't go to college, I think he did, or he didn't go to elite college, but he found that he, it was hard for him on the labor market. And so it's this idea that rather than screening a resume, you actually look at a work product and then make your hiring decisions. And um, there's some research out of Stanford to suggest that's not enough. You actually get people who are more diverse through your door when you do that, but then we meet them in person and we have all the same biases that get us in favor of the, the people we would have scored anyways. So I think that there are some, there are some Things that are promising, but again, we're still humans, and as long as you know we're programming the machines, I think we're going to have some 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 unintended 
consequences. Right. And so another question is about what kind of interview structure you would recommend. So would it be to have the entire thing structured? Would it be to mix structured interview with other tools or tests? Would you use personality assessments, behavioral style questions? You know, what, ex what kind of structure would you recommend? Yes. So um, it depends on who you talk to. There are IO psychologists, which are industrial organizational psychologists, who have these batteries of tools where you can take like you know, 30 minutes of on those Scantron tests that everyone seems to be afraid of. Um, and I, I'm not necessarily a fan of those. Um, I think that, again, I am mostly a fan of doing simulations. So again, get someone to do the work that you're, tr you're trying to get them to do. So if you do a lot of doc review, have someone do doc review. Realizing that also you're not hiring only for the immediate position, but you're hiring for some sort of uh, a series. So I, I think that is, that is an important part of it. Um, I also think that consulting is a really good model for having some sort of simulated interaction um, but there are some limitations that and I, I've extrapolated some things I would change about that process. So as I mentioned before, you orally solve a business case with someone, you know, should these two companies merge, things like that, and at least gets the conversation on job relevant stuff. Um, I would want those conversations to be more structured in terms of you would make sure interviewees actually stick to the script. There's some people in consulting who just start talking about the weather, um, making sure there's a scoring rubric so we're all similar in how we actually judge answers. But um, the other thing that I would suggest doing is that whenever we have a test like that where you're trying to simulate what someone's going to do on the job, so we actually want to put it at the beginning of an interview rather than the end. And that's one of the things we see in consulting is that those interviews, which are those consulting case interviews, which can be very useful, again, they have biases of their own, but they can be useful, happen after 15 minutes of conversation of how's the weather, what do you like to do in your spare time. We know from research that interviewees make up their mind about candidates within the first 30 to 90 seconds of meeting them, right? So what are you making your decision off of? You're making your decision off of are we the same place? Do I like your shoes? Whatever it is that's not necessarily job relevant. And then we're losing the value of this. So I like to actually suggest that people do any sort of job relevant test at the beginning. And right. people sometimes say that's awkward. But again, you can smile. You can say hi. You can say, hey, we're going to get right into it. This might feel weird at first. We're just going to get right into this. Um, and this is how it's going to go. You could also take it offline a little bit. One consulting firm used to do paper and pencil cases and give people five minutes to think about it because that was more similar to how work actually happened. Um, in consulting case interviews, you're expected to do math in your head. That would never happen in a consulting firm because you have Excel constantly. Like Again, making tweaks to, to, to test job relevance um, and job relevant skills in a way to see how if it's similar to how work is actually performed I think is important and then doing it at the beginning. So another question about structured interviews is that a common counter argument is that students will rehearse their answers so what are your thoughts on that? Well I think if you're asking a lot of I get a lot of when I talk to people from law firms they say oh we do very structured interviewing we do behavioral interviewing and I say what do you mean by behavioral interviewing and they say tell me about a time you failed. That's our structured interview. That is an open-ended question. That is actually, it is tapping behaviors in some respects, but that is an open-ended interview. You're, you have no guidance as to how to actually judge that answer. Um, and so, um, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Say it again. <laughs> no worries. Um, this is about a common counter argument that students will rehearse their answers yes, if they you have a structured interview. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So students rehearse their answers to common questions like, what is your greatest weakness? What is your greatest strength? Why do you want to be a lawyer? Things like this. Yes, people will have first uh, questions or their answers. But I think that those job relevant tests actually can do a lot to eliminate that, right? There is the risk that somehow word would get out about what case you're going to do, um, which does happen in other industries, but generally people don't remember the specifics. But you knock people off their preparation a little bit more. And that's the whole goal of, I think, about smarter interviewing is not to get people's, like, their practice stumps speeches because that doesn't predict on the job performance. You actually want to test their skills that are related to on right. the job performance. So even if you're trying to test someone's social skills, having them do sort of some sort of social task together and looking, um, I think you avoid some of that fluff that we're so worried about in, um, in interviewing in general. So we have a couple of questions about what happens once people are inside the, the firms. I know that you studied hiring specifically, but a couple of people have asked, you know, do you know if similar issues are replicated in promotions of lower income, um, people of lower income backgrounds? Mm -hmm. Another person has asked, once a person from a lower socioeconomic background is in the law firm, does their background continue to have an impact or are they so busy for work that they don't have time to talk about fly fishing? Nope. It, <laughs> you'd like to think that, right? But people find in the airport, when you're on your way to the restroom, people find ways. 
People often get tracked. There's some research on this in law firms that even at the end of the hiring process, before you're actually signed, sealed, deliver, that partners have already figured out who the superstars are, and people start to be you know, sorted. And some partners will go to certain associates, even when they're summers and things like this. So, you know, some people become the favorites, and that though we know those reputations actually persist through people's careers. Um, there's a great book that came out about a month ago by Daniel Lorison, who's at Swarthmore, um, and Sam Friedman, who's at um, London School of Economics, called The Class Ceiling, and it answers exactly exactly this question, and the answer is yes, your class background continues to matter a lot, and it manifests in promotions, it also manifests in your compensation for doing the exact same job, and they call it the class ceiling. Um, so, so yes, it, it, it does matter. Um, and some of these distinctions also matter. Um, you know, these distinctions between core and non-core schools, this is not an example from my book, this is an example from my personal life. Um, my partner uh, used to work for a consulting firm and went to Northwestern where I teach. That's not, that sounded like it could be gross. It wasn't gross like that. Um, <laughs> it did not mean like that. But um, he, Northwestern is not considered to be a core school for consulting. It's considered to be an okay school, right, even though it's a very well-regarded school. He would come home and talk about how, like, there was discrimination against Northwestern students. Like, he felt as a Northwestern grad that it was just, it was, like, so oppressive and people treated him like he was so not intelligent and he was from, and it was, like, dude, it's number 10 in the country, you're still doing pretty well. So, I mean, it's not only social class, it's some of these other criteria, and we know from research, race is a huge factor, gender is a huge factor. Um, so, so the situation doesn't go away once you're on the job. And so, in reference to that, that book, The Class Ceiling, um, as I understand it, they looked at other industries as well, right? Like yeah. TV production and acting yep. industry and yeah. so forth. So, how much of this, um, th these similar to me biases and elite reproduction do you think is unique to these elite professional service firms that you looked at? And how much of it is really kind of across the board, every kind of employer that has some disproportionate number of elites inside of it will have similar kinds of problems. I think it's quite similar. I mean, it always takes different forms and different preferences. I like to think of academia, that's a very different type of occupation. What a cultural fit with us is very different. It's not, you know, did you play lacrosse? Did you, you know, things like this. It's basically, can you name all the nerdy directors and all the outhouse films? But like, people are looking for people who are similar to themselves outside of work in terms of their right. personalities and biographies. So I do think that transcends. And there was a survey done it. I think it was, what was it? It was a couple of years ago over internationally, I think it was 82% of employers in a large survey said that they look for cultural fit and it was one of the most important criteria that they use. Um, Again, I do think that the specific universities might vary, or if you know, if we're talking about elite jobs, graduate degrees and things like that might vary, and there are different permutations of the content, but I, I think the general process is similar. And so someone asked on the lacrosse point, tell us more about sports bias, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my favorite one. So, and it's the one when I teach MBA students, they get so mad about. So I talked earlier about this US bias that we have for, towards excitement and emotion, which is a well-established thing that psychologists talk about. Um, we in the US also have this athletic bias. We love athletes. We really, really love athletes. Uh, we love extracurricular activities, but we, like, we, we, we are inspired by athletes. We think it's you know amazing. So um, you see this play out in the recruiting process in that people are looking for in extracurricular activities, what is the preferred extracurricular activity that anyone has? Sports. And we're not talking about pick up soccer or playing basketball in the neighborhood. We're talking about you are on a sports team and you, you stick with this. And people have all sorts of justifications for why this is the best. Um, but, and we think of sports as meritocratic. Anyone can pick up a ball and play. Um, but in fact, what people were looking for is you were on a team at a university or you were you know on some sort of competitive team where you were you know potentially in line to go to some national competition or the Olympics what you see in that context is that actually is not democratic at all it requires a ton of money in these sports leagues I mean there's an estimate I heard the other day where it's like the average American uh, middle class and above spends some ridiculous amount on children's athletics it was something like 20 or thirty thousand um, dollars in the course of someone's childhood um, it's, it's the cost of teams, um, someone has to take you to and from practice. I mean, these things get are enrolling earlier and earlier. You have two and a half year olds who are in competitive leagues. The travel teams in New York City have been at five or six, I heard, screening. Right? This is not an activity that is open for all. It's time, it's money, it's classed. Um, so, and there was a study that was done by um, 
Derek Bach, who used to be the president of Harvard um, and a long time ago, and some other researchers looking at this longitudinal study, and they were looking at this question, Shulman is an author on that too, they were looking at this question of are athletes actually better prepared, because a lot of people think they are. And they found that it wasn't athletics that actually did anything. It was just participating in any time of time-consuming endeavor was the real predictor of, of success later on. And so it didn't matter if it was debate or athletics, or having a full-time job, or a part-time job, or athletics. But this is an experience. Um, athletics, I think, are just so culturally resonant, both for the democratic value, and also if you look at upper middle class and upper class communities everywhere, what are people doing with their kids? They're shuttling them to and from sport practices that make it difference. So that was my little riff on sports bias. I'm happy to talk more. <laughs> Great. So we've um, unfortunately uh, reached time that we have to conclude, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, and everyone keep your hands together and thank uh, Professor Rivera. Thank you.